Because, you know, it's an honor to preach uh, in his pulpit. He's the shepherd of the house, and I don't for one minute take it lightly. And uh, so I look forward to today share the word with you. And as Pastor said, uh, Cindy and I have, uh, we were, uh, for the last four years, when we transitioned out of Jubilee, we were in Hawaii. Uh, we must have done something right. And so the Lord sent us to paradise to help a church out there for four years, and uh, we've transitioned back, and it's good to be home, amen? It is so good to be home and to be back under Pastor Dick's anointing and leadership, and uh, Cindy and I. Cindy, by the way, is the one that led worship. Uh, that beautiful woman is my wife. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> We're going to leave it right there, somebody. Uh, your pastor's been sharing, and I know next week he's going to share a lot more about Panama and, and just the things that God's been doing, but we do have two photos that we can put them up really quick. Uh, this is uh, Pastor Dick with Pastors uh, Choho and Don George all the way in Panama, and uh, they did an incredible conference where Pastor Dick and Pastor Adam shared at, and then Pastor had the honor of spending time with the president of Panama, Juan Carlos Varela, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing how the Lord used him, amen, and sharing to the president. Don't you love it when God opens doors for your pastor to share? Come on. That's God sharing, uh, opening doors for him to share the good news and the gospel. And so uh, I absolutely love that. Can't wait to hear, hear all the great stories. Well, um, before we get into the Word today, um, you know, we, I love to pray before we get in the Word. Come on, somebody. We need the Lord, the Holy Spirit to take, you know, just uh, the Logos, turn it into Rhema. How many of you know that God wants you to leave better than what you came in? Amen. So when we do this, when we stand to our feet, grab the hand of the person that left and right, and uh, we're going to pray today. Stretch across if you need to. Just grab someone and say, how's it? How are you doing? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your presence as we worshiped you. We thank you, Lord, that in your presence is fullness of joy. Lord, we're not here by accident. Lord, we're here on assignment. There's something you have today to deposit in our lives. Lord, it might just be one thing that we need to catch today, Lord. And I pray that that nugget, that Holy Spirit, you would deposit it right into our heart. Have, give us today clarity of mind, ears to hear, and open hearts, Father. Lord, we thank you for uh, Pastor Dick and as he's ministering in Panama, that you would just anoint him and use him and bring him, Pastor Adam, and the team back safely as they travel tomorrow, Lord. Lord, tomorrow we honor Dr. Martha Luther King. And Lord, we thank you for his leadership, his inspiration, how he pointed this nation to you, Lord, and your truth, Lord. And we pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders today that that same heart and spirit would be in them and that you would raise up more leaders like Dr. King, Lord, that would influence us and move us forward to be a nation that hungers and thirsts after you. Lord, we pray today for the hand of the person we're holding on the left and the right, Lord. We might not know what season they're in right now, but Lord, you know the season they're in. And we declare, we speak over them right now, Lord. Blessing, favour, health, wholeness, prosperity, deliverance. Whatever the need is, Lord, we thank You that You are more than able, Lord. And so, Lord, as we get ready for Your Word, speak to us now. We pray all these things in the name above every name, the name of Jesus. And a faithful church said, Amen. Amen. Come on, high five somebody. Go ahead, grab a seat. Amen. And uh, you'll notice I do have an accent. If you uh, are new here, welcome to Jubilee. And uh, my wife and I, we're originally from South Africa. Um, and uh, so I talk fast, I preach fast, but uh, I heard that 11 o'clock is louder than 9 a.m. And uh, 9, 9 a.m., they were, they were jumping, they were shouting, they were talking back, they were like, preach it, white boy. I mean, they, they, they were doing their thing. And, and so uh, you all need to outdo 9 o'clock, amen? And so uh, you help me out and we'll get through this, amen. Also wanna uh, welcome those online, wherever you are in the world, whatever state you're in. And uh, hopefully if you're in San Jose, you're gonna come to church sometime, I'd love to see you, but you're a part of our family and we're so glad that you have logged in as well. Well, uh, I wanna continue a little bit on the theme. Pastor Dick's been teaching us the keys to a blessed life. Come on, that's a great series. If you've missed any of this, you need to go online and catch up. But how many of you believe today that God wants to bless you? Come on, He does. You know, sometimes it's so easy for us to say, yeah, God wants to bless the pastors, the staff, or, you know, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so because they're spiritual. I mean, just look at the way they worship God. I mean, and, but, you know, it's easy for them. But for me, I don't really know if God 
wants to bless me? Does God really care about me? In Genesis chapter 12, uh, Pastor Dick's been launching every weekend with this, this verse, uh, verse 1 to 3 in the New King James. It's the Abrahamic covenant. It says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house. Come on, how many of you are glad that God's trying to get you somewhere? Amen. Come on, God knows where He wants to take you. And he says, to land that I will show you, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I love that right there. Come on, God wants your name to be great. He didn't say famous, he said great. That means when your neighbor talks about you, there's greatness. That means when the people at work talk about you, there's greatness attached. They say, oh man, you know what? I'm so honored to work with so-and-so. Isn't it great? You know, I don't know about you, but Monday's not the most exciting day of the week for some people. But when you come walking into work on a Monday, people go, oh man, you just made my day. I love your smile. It's contagious. I love your passion. I love you. You're just positive all the time. Wow, people speak about your name because it's great. Come on, God wants your name to be great this morning. He says, listen to this, I love verse three. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in, all, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I love that. See, some, there are gonna be some people in life that are haters. You know what God says? He says, I'm gonna bless those that bless you. And what does he say? Those that curse you, I got it. I love that because it tells me that I can't make everybody happy. I'm not called to do that. I'm called to make God happy and be the best version of me. And those that don't like me, hey, that's up to God. Amen. God gonna handle that. Come on, that's freedom for someone today. Be a God pleaser, not a man pleaser. But I love this verse, because God says what? I wanna bless you. That's the heart of God this morning. The title of today's message, if you take your notes, is called, When God Gets Your Heart. See, I believe when God gets your heart, that's when you begin to enter into the blessed life. But God says, I want to bless you. That's His heart. That's His motive. He says, I want to bless you. I want your name to be great. Why? We should ask God, why do you want to do that? And He gives us the answer, so that you can be a blessing. Come on, someone's miracle is deposited in your future. So God's trying to get something to you so He can do something through you. God says, I want to bless you. I love... Uh, Psalms chapter 92, verse 12 and 15, it says, The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like the cedar in Lebanon. Listen to verse 13. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall what? Flourish in the courts of our God. They shall, they shall still bear fruit in old age. Come on, somebody. And they shall be fresh and flourishing. Oh, what a promise like that. I, I like to say the word flourish uh, is the word blessed. It says those that are what? Planted in what? The house are blessed. They're flourishing. There's abundance coming out of them. You know, a year ago, I read a very interesting article uh, and it was, uh, the title was pretty simple. It was planted or potted. Are you planted or are you potted? Now I'm gonna preach that message because that's another one. <laughs> but the article was all about Christians today, today that in, in, in America, we have more potted Christians than planted. See, Christians in America love to jump around. Well, where's the newest thing? Who's the newest guy? Who's, who wrote the new book? Who's got the new album? Who has the new light show? Who's doing this and that? And we'll, we'll just get in our pots and lift it and go there. And when we're not happy and our needs aren't being met, because it's all about me, isn't it? I'm just gonna take my pot, and I'm just gonna go to the one down the road. And the reality is at the end of the day, if you stay in that mentality or that flow, you're gonna look and say, why is my life not flourishing? Why is there no blessing in my life? Because pretty simple, Solomon says, you're not planted. See, it's planted Christians that, that flourish. It's planted Christians that are blessed. What does that look like? It looks like it's pretty simple like this. Get behind the vision of the man of God in this house. Come on, pastor's been talking about 500,000 church plants. What does that mean? That's an assignment for you and I to get planted. Planted looks like what? We don't just financially give to it. We get on our knees for it. We're inviting people to it. We're finding a life group. Why? Because we want to be planted Christians and not potted Christians. You see, when I think of the word planted, uh, I think of the word all in. All in. 
Come on, how many of you are glad that God was all in when he sent Jesus Christ for you? Come on, how many of you are so excited today? Lord, I thank you that you sent Jesus. He healed me. He set me free. He delivered me. He changed my attitude. He gave me a new heart. God was all in. He didn't hold back. He gave his best. You know, I was thinking about that this week. And, you know, because when I was 13, I gave my life to Jesus. I was all in. But there was another time in my life where, where I was all in. You see, there was this girl at Bible college that sat in front of me, and I didn't really notice her. But one Sunday night at church, I was kind of a church a little smaller than this, but it had a balcony. I was upstairs, and, and, uh, and during worship, come on, I was single, y'all. I was looking around during worship. <laughs> All the single people are like, amen. Every now and then you worship God, but you're still looking, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you're calling those things they're being or as they were. <laughs> and during worship, I, I was upstairs and I looked down and four rows from the front, I, I, I saw this, this woman worshiping and I kid you not, there was a glow on her and I was like, whoa, man. <laughs> and I was like, she's so fine, she's so fine, she's gotta be mine, somebody. And I'm just looking right there and, and I'm just like, pastor's getting ready to preach and I'm like, this better be the quickest message. Just say, Jesus wept and amen, do the altar call and we're done. And I'm looking there and I'm waiting, man. And when Pastor Dunn was the call and Pastor said, Amen, church is done, see you next week. I ran from the top down. I didn't care if there was a new person, a new salvation, a baby dedication. I didn't care. I just needed to get to the front. I went right up to Cindy and she looked at me like, what? And I said, you, me, coffee now. That's all I could say. <laughs> How romantic is that? I'm still paying for it today, people. And so, and she went to coffee and, and I spoke, I, I just kind of spoke for two hours. She just listened and that was coffee. It was awesome. And, and uh, uh, two weeks later, I said, hey, come over and meet my parents. I brought her home and I uh, kid you not, I, I introduced her uh, and then uh, when she had dinner with us, she went home. My mom looked at me and said, boy, she's out of your league. <laughs> I was like, thanks, mom. Hey, Mother's Day's in a few months. You ain't getting nothing. And... Uh, and I remember the first official date, you know, where I'm going to ask Cindy to be my girlfriend and to start courting me. And, and I remember I had this whole plan. I, I, I was kind of looking around asking for the best Italian restaurant. I'm like, because that's what you do. That's what the movies say. Italian restaurant. And I cleaned the car. My dad's like, what are you doing polishing the car? I've never seen you do that. This woman's really, <laughs> I'm polishing the car. I'm going to clean. I spent two hours finding a teddy bear and roses for her. Two hours. I said, I've got to get the right teddy bear. And I remember picking her up and going to the Italian. Yes, the first problem, she's back in the day, then she was vegetarian. So that wasn't a good choice. And we were talking, and I gave her the roses. She's like, oh, thank you. And I gave her the teddy bear, and she was kind of shocked. Let me tell you something. That teddy bear, I spent, I think, for the rest, uh, after that night, stayed in the closet. She's like, that's today, she says, that's the most ugliest teddy bear that I have. I took two hours to find that thing. I was desperate. But here we are, March, we're gonna be married for 16 years. See, you know what, you know what I love uh, about Cindy is uh, I was all in. You know how I know I was all in? She got my heart. She got my heart and I got her heart. And you have to think, she didn't know everything about me. She didn't know some of the baggage I came with, some of the fears, some of the insecurities. I didn't know some of her baggage and hurts and hangups. But you know what, we were all in and we're still all in it together, somebody. How many of you are glad today that you know what? When you give your heart to God, you're not giving it to a God that has hurts, hangups, and disappointments. You're giving your, your heart to a God that is faithful, a God that is caring, a God that knows every hair on your head, a God that's got a plan and a future and a destiny, a God that's omnipresent with you all the time, omniscient, knows everything about you, omnipotent, all powerful, ready to move on your behalf. That's the God that we get to give our heart to. But when you think about that, you think, well, God, you're giving yourself to me? I mean, hello, look at me. See, sometimes, you know, when you think about covenant, the reality is this. The only thing we have to offer God is what? Our broken hearts. And you know what God says? That's all I want. That's all He wants today. See, when God gets your heart, this is what I love. You know what? You become secure in your future. You become secure, not in your identity, your wisdom, your gifts. You become confident in Him. See, when the enemy comes your way, you can stop and say, hey, my God got this one. You don't worry about the economy. You don't worry about your boss. Yes, you think he's the devil and you have scripture for him. 
When you go in on Monday, you're like, are you praying? You know, God's not intimidated by that, my friend. He is for you and you can rest in your God. You see, when you give your heart to God, you don't just get a secure future, my friend. When you give your heart to God, you get a peace that surpasses all understanding. God, I love Philippians 4. It says, be anxious for what? Nothing. But in all things, pray. What does verse 7 say? And it says, God will fill you with a peace that what? Surpasses all understanding. That means in the natural, I might not have the answers, but you see, when God gets my heart, He gives me peace to say, hey, it's going to be all right. No matter what the valley in, what season you're in, say, I can't even see through this mist and this fog. My friend, just put your hand in the hand of Jesus. It's going to be all right. So when we think about this, when God gets my heart, we should ask the question then, well, how do I surrender my heart to Jesus? How do I surrender? You see, I've had the opportunity to visit with some people, you know, through ministry and talk with some people at coffee shops. And I'll say, hey, man, have you been to church? And some people will say, yeah, I went once. Well, why don't you go back? Well, you know, the, the pastor shared about Jesus being Lord and Savior and, and that I'd walk out and everything's gonna be all right. And the reality is I gave my life to Jesus, but I went home to the same husband, the same kids, the same boss, the same situation. I, I don't understand where it is. And yes, the reality is, that's why Jesus says, in this world, you're gonna face what? Trials and tribulations. But He says, you can have what? Joy. Why? Because I've overcome. See, Jesus didn't say abracadabra, it's all gonna be smooth sailing. He's gonna say, no, no, I'm in the boat with you now. When you give your heart to me, you can have a confidence that I am with you. I'm gonna see you through and I'm gonna bring you peace. So how do we surrender our hearts to God? You see, the heart is so important to God. The heart is so important to God. In fact, uh, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 19 it says, as in water, face reflects face, so a man's heart reveals the man. What is God looking at? Our heart. What is He focused on? On our hearts. You know, it's sad to say sometimes us Christians spend more time on the external, the outside, than worrying about what's going on on the inside. See, God's more concerned about the inside because if He gets the, the heart, what's gonna happen? The outside will change. See, I love that about our God. Solomon puts it so great in Proverbs chapter four, uh, verse, uh, verses 20. Listen to the words of Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Don't let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of where? Your heart for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Listen to verse 23. I wanna focus on this one. Keep your heart with all diligence. Why? For out of it springs what? The issues of life. The New Living Translation puts it so great. It says, God, your heart above what? All else, for it determines the course of your life. Solomon is basically saying this. The reason why you end up at a destination that you didn't want to end up at, the, you know, the station of hurt, hang up, disappointment, anger, jealousy, insecurity, the reason you get there is because you didn't guard your heart. He says, if you guard your heart and you give God your heart, it will affect the direction and the course of your life. Come on, there's some of us today that just have to stop and say, my heart, my responsibility. We don't like to hear that. See, Solomon is saying what? You guard your heart. Come on, some of us want to blame our pops, our moms, uncle so-and-so, our neighborhood we grew up in, our lack of what we didn't have. And God stops and says, quit making excuses. Guard your heart, give me your heart, and watch the direction and course that I guard, I'm gonna take you on. My heart, my responsibility. Your heart, your responsibility. So how, what does it look like when we give our hearts to God? I wanna give you three thoughts today. The first one's gonna be out of Romans chapter seven. And this is, if you've never read Romans chapter seven from verse 14, it's just the most interesting passage. It's the apostle Paul, who was Saul, who knew the law, the Bible, encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, personal encounter, who are you, Lord? I mean, this is a smart man that encountered Jesus. I mean, this is a wise man who knows the law. And here he is in, uh, in Romans chapter seven, we read from verse 14. 
So we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law, that is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. I find the law that is uh, evil is present with me and the, good, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members worrying, worrying against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. <laughs> I love verse 24. Oh, wretched man that I am. Man, why didn't you say that in the beginning? <laughs> He's like, man, what I don't wanna do, I do. What I don't wanna do, I do. And I'm so confused. And he goes, there's a tension inside of me. He said, there's a, I think there's a tension that many of us live with too. See, Paul says, man, when I, when, I, when I go to Jubilee on a Sunday and the Spirit of God is there, I get my praise on and I'm jumping and I'm amen and I'm receiving the Word, I am so pumped up. I live here pumped up, man. I'm like high-fiving everybody. I'm just like, woohoo! it's gonna be a great week until I get into my car and I try to get on Highway 237 and that brother cuts me off. I just lost my anointing right there. Yeah, I get into the car with my wife and we were smiling at each other and then we pick up the argument that we had coming in. I lost my anointing. It's the, things, I, the things that I don't want to do, I do. And the things that I, I want to do, Paul says, I don't. He says, man, wretched man. Paul's, basically, Paul's saying, man, I'm just cray-cray. I'm just flat up cray-cray. I'm crazy. He's gets this attention in me. It's man, wretched man am I. It's like, what am I gonna do with this? And then verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, uh, with the flesh, the law of sin. And then we have the, one of the most not known verses in the Bible, Romans chapter eight, verse one. For there, uh, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. See, let me tell you something. A lot of us know Romans 8, 1. We walk around, there's no condemnation. There's no condemnation. There's no condemnation like robots. But you've got to have a Romans 7 encounter before you can have Romans 8. See, what was Paul doing in Romans 7? If you take your notes, point number one. Paul is recognizing what? His deceitful nature. Paul stops and says, you know, I love God and I wanna live for God. But he says, hey, there's a flesh in me that wants to do its own thing. And he says, man, there's a struggle in me, but what do I do? I look up to Jesus, who's my Saviour. I give my heart to Jesus. He says, I'm not gonna face this in myself. He says, I'm gonna face it in the power of Jesus Christ. He says, it's gonna be a pull here, but every time I'm pulled in this direction, I'm gonna say, Lord, I need you. I'm not gonna look at the storm, the temptation. I'm gonna look at you because you're gonna get me to where I need to be, to the blessed life, Lord. But I love that about Paul. He does what? He recognises his deceitful nature. Can I give you a thought today that you're not gonna like? Okay, I've asked permission. You might have a nice smile. You might look good on the outside. You might be the smartest cat in the room. You might know how to pray, quote scripture better than me. But I wanna tell you something, there's still a deceitful nature in you. You're like, nah, come on, Pastor. Let me read to you Jeremiah. Chapter 17, let's look, look, look what the Lord says to the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 17, verse nine. The heart is what? Deceitful above all things. And desperately what? Wicked. Who can know it? Listen to verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. In interesting, it doesn't say, I search your good works. I search your spirituality. I search your heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. See, here's the, good, here's the hope for us today, church. God sees our heart. 
He knows the heart of humanity is desperately wicked. He knows like in Paul, there's a draw for us to do our own thing, to run rogue, to give into our flesh. And God says, I know that about you. And here's the good news. I still love you. I still choose you. Hey, when the enemy tells you you're a pathetic Christian, you're useless. Why do you keep falling? Hey, get up and say, there's no condemnation. Why? Because God has my heart, friend. And God knows where I'm at. See, you know the freedom when you begin to recognize that man, you know what, I have a deceitful nature. Yes, the freedom. I don't have to pretend anymore. Come on, someone need to hear that today. You don't need to pretend you got it all put together. Just be real. God knows anyway. And here's the second thing. I don't have to fix my heart and then bring it to God. How freeing is that? He just said, God, thank you today that you love me and that you, God, want my heart. Second person I want to look at today, so point number one is recognize deceitful nature. Second person I want to look at is, is David, King David. In fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, the prophet Samuel is going to King Saul to say, Saul, your heart has wandered from God. And God's going to select and raise up a new king. In verse 14, it says, But now your kingdom shall not continue, speaking of Saul. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be the commander of his people, because you have not kept what the Lord has commanded. And you can go read in Acts 13, verse 22. It says, David, a man after God's own heart. So God looks at King Saul and says, Your heart is wandered. You're not giving me your heart. So God says, I've looked around. I've looked for what? A man after my own heart. Come on, somebody. I believe God's still looking today for people. He, you don't need a. You need, sometimes we're looking for man to recognize us. Come on, let's let God recognize us. Let's just say, God, look at, yes, my heart, God. It ain't beautiful. It's messy. Hey, there's some stuff in me that ain't perfect. But Lord, here it is. Take it. Make something wonderful. That's why the Scripture says He takes out the heart of stone and He puts it in a heart of flesh. I love that. But yes, David is, God's looking and, and, and he sees him. And we see in 1 Samuel chapter 16, the prophet Samuel comes to the house of Jesse because one of Jesse's boys is going to be the next king in, in verse 6 of 1 Samuel 16. And so it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, surely the Lord is anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. If a man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at what? The heart. And so Jesse brings his seven boys over there and they pass and Samuel's going, okay, well, one down, six more to go, uh, two down, five more to go. Which one of these? Man, Lord, I really thought it was him. He goes through all the sons and then he's like, okay, Lord, you missed it. What's going on, Lord? So he says, uh, Jesse, uh, do you have any more boys? He goes, uh, yeah, I got one. It's kind of an excuse for a son. He's kind of weird, man. He likes to like talk to sheep and lead them in worship. He's a little runt. He's, he's, he don't look that good. He's got some pimples and some, and he says, bring him to me. And King David comes and we know the story. He anoints him. See, God saw what? The heart of David. God's like, if I can get your heart, I can use you. But we know, we fast forward the story of King David and the Bible says that in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11, during the time of war where kings went to battle. See, David was a great king, a great warrior. He, had, he defeated all his enemies and one day he just decides, you know what, man, I, I don't th feel like I need to go out. I just need to like, you know, chillax a little bit. I just need to stay home and relax, kick up the feet. I mean, the battle is so easy. We've defeated everybody. I mean, it's like a no-brainer for my mighty man. I'm just gonna stay back. You see, what began to happen there is David's heart began to shift to his own desires. And one night he's on his balcony, he's looking out and at night uh, he looks across and he sees a, a woman naked taking a bath, Bathsheba was her name. And, and David's like, all of a sudden his heart is, is beginning to lust and it's, it's moving further away to his own desires. And he says, get her, bring her to me. And they bring Bathsheba to David and we know the story, he slept with her. And she comes to David and she's says, uh, uh, David, uh, I did the test, uh, I'm pregnant. Da, 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 da. A man after God's own heart. What does David do? He's like, oh, I've got to cover this up quick. 
It's like, get Uriah, that's Sheba's husband. Get Uriah, bring him to me. And he's like, yo, Uriah, I had this idea, man. I got this new thing. I'm gonna reward some of my best soldiers. And you know, you've been away from Bathsheba, your wife. And by the way, your wife is just good looking. And so I'm just gonna let you get some quality time with your wife because you're doing a good job. High five. And Uriah does what? Because God has Uriah's heart and he's a man of integrity and character. He says, how can I go be with my wife when all my brothers are still on the battlefield? And he says, no, no, I'll sleep at the gate. And David's like, no, come on, go be with your wife. He says, no, I won't. David realizes he's not gonna be with his wife. He's gonna get exposed. So what does he do? He sends Uriah to the heat of the battle where Uriah is killed. So David went from what? Adultery to murder. Adultery to murder, he's coming. Now he thinks, oh, look, I'm gonna be Bathsheba. Hey, you move in next door, girl, because I've got a room for you and I'm a good king. I'm gonna take care of you. Everyone's gonna see you. I'm gonna take care. But here's the problem. God sees the heart of David. God sees all things, my friend. And the prophet Nathan comes to David. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse eight. Listen to the words the prophet says. He says, I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into you keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that hadn't been too little, I also would have given you much more. God's saying, David, I was gonna give you so much. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your own and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. It's exposed, it's in the open. David can't hide. He realizes, man, God is omniscient. He knows all things. He saw everything. In verse 13, he's so beautiful. David said, 2 Samuel 12, 13, so David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. I love that. All of a sudden, it's out in the open. There's freedom for David. He steps out and he says, I have sinned. I have sinned against the Lord. Point number two is this. We've got to commit to full exposure. Transparency. See, David realized, man, you know what? God had my heart, but I began to wander off and do my own thing. And I went down a road because I didn't guard my heart. The course of my life changed and I ended up here getting a woman pregnant and killing her husband. But God sent the prophet Nathan. Why? Because God loves me so much. Aren't you glad that God never gives up on us? Come on, He chases us down because He loves us. And what does David do? He, he repents, but then... There's a consequence for sin, my friend. You see, God will forgive your sin, but there's still a consequence. And the consequence is that this kid that Bathsheba gave birth to became ill. And David, for seven days, he's on the ground crying before God, fasting, praying. And on the seventh day, he heard that the, they heard that the kid had died. David gets up. He washes himself clean, anoints himself, puts on new robes. And he goes where? He goes to the house of the Lord to worship. Because he realized in that moment God wants my heart. He realized his deceitfulness. He realized his wandering spirit. He committed to honesty before the Lord and he responds and he goes to the Lord. That's why I love Psalm 51 because Psalm 51 is what I call the prayer. David's prayer where he exposes his heart before God and Psalm 51 verse five. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me. David's saying, God, wash me. I'll be wider than stone. Listen to verse 10 of Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. See, David recognized my heart was deceitful. He recognized and committed to transparency and he, the exposure of his heart. God, yes, where I'm at. And then he says to God, God, yes, my heart. Come on, there's some of us today that have to stop and say, God, I've wandered off, man. But you won't stop chasing me. You never give. You know, the Roman says it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. My friend, God's not out to condemn you, beat you up, chase you down, tell you how pathetic you are. God's a God that loves and says, come on, just get real with me. Quit pretending, quit covering up, man. I know all things. I got a plan and I love you. David lost his way. But when he turned his heart to God, he found his purpose and direction. Third thought is found in 1 John Chapter 1, verse 7 to 10. 
But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen to verse 10. If we claim we have not sinned, we're calling God a liar and showing that His Word has no place in our heart. Point number three is this. Nurture an active daily accountability with God and others. I wanna camp there for a minute. Who are you accountable to? You know, Solomon says, iron sharpens iron. Who's sharpening you? You see, it's so easy for us to point out the faults in others. It's so easy for us to sharpen others. Come on. It's so easy for us to show us, well, if you just prayed more, maybe if you did your devotions, maybe if you came to church more, maybe if you tithed, maybe if you served, maybe if you, maybe if you, maybe if you. Well, what about you, my friend? See, Jesus says, hey, don't worry about the speck in your brother's eye. Look at the plank in your own. See, when you give your heart to God and you say, God, yeah, I recognize it. I get it, Lord. I need you. Yes, my broken heart. I commit to full exposure. Wash me clean. Restore my heart. Give me a brand new heart. I thank you, Lord. But now I want to stay here, Lord, in the blessed life. And how do I do that? I need, God, you to hold me accountable by your word. And I need people to hold me accountable. That's what I love what Pastor Dick is saying to us. Get in a life group. Why? Because you need accountability. Here's something I've learned about Christianity. You can't do it by yourself. Isolation is the devil's playground. See, I've got three brothers in my life, and one of them you know, Pastor Nate Sagai. I used to be his boss at Urgency, and now we're, we're on the same ground. And I've invited him, and he's invited me, and we talk every other day, and we ask each other tough questions. Sometimes he'll say, Charlton, when last did you take your wife on date night? And I'm like, don't go there. <laughs> We're not talking about that. And he's like, no, 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 I'm gonna camp there. You want a blessed marriage? Right. Romance your wife. Amen. I'm like, no, you don't talk to me like that. You, ah, and it's like, I'm holding you accountable. So next time I talk to you, Charlton, you better have had date night. And there's times I do that with him. Why? Because iron sharpens iron. We need accountability. Let me tell you something. Sign up for a life group. And you might go there and it might not be fun. That's okay. Go back and say, I didn't like that one. Can I find another one? It's okay, I've done it. But get accountability in your life. Invite accountability. It's gonna make you a better Christian. So how do we give our hearts to God? Recognize our deceitful nature. We're gonna commit to full exposure and then nurture active daily accountability with God and with others. As we close, um, I believe the blessed life, I believe one of the keys to a blessed life is when you give your heart to God. For some of us today, we've been serving the Lord for years, but He might not have your heart. Or maybe you're here today, someone invited you or you just drove by and you've never given your heart to God. You see, God has so much for you, my friend. God is not a God that judges or criticizes, beats us with a stick. He's a God that invites. He says, man, I know who you are. I know where you're at. And I have great things in store for your life. You know, I was thinking of the game. How many of you used to play the game Monopoly when you were young? Remember that game? I had to go to counseling because of that game. <laughs> I'm not good at board games. My wife is. That's why we don't play any. And... Uh, but when I was a kid, my sister loved Monopoly. And she was so good at Monopoly, man. She'd buy houses and I'd, be, I'd get the dice to, the die to roll and I'd be like, please, Lord, don't let it in. And boom, it lands on her and she'd take my money. And I'm like, I'm just like, and she'd, lo and she'd laugh like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I'd get so fed up and storm out. And, but she used to get this card. And she used to look at this card and then she'd look at me and smile. Look at the card, smile. And she would turn it and it was the go to jail card. What put that? <laughs> go to Richard Jail. Do not pass. Go. Do not collect 200. And she used to smile. Whenever I mean, I see that smile, I'd be like, man. But then I got smart, you see, because there's another card in Monopoly. And I get this card. Go to the next one. Chance. This, 
This art may be kept until need or soul to get out of jail free card. And I used to get that card. And here's what I'd do. I'd slip it under the board that she didn't know. <laughs> and and she, would, she would get that jail card and she'd look at it and she'd smile. And I was like, I'd just play along. Like, I know where you're going, girlfriend. It's all good. <laughs> and she would smile and she'd turn and I'd go to jail. And I'd be like, uh, snap, there it is. Get out of jail free. See, sometimes the devil wants to tell you, you're not good enough. Ah, oh, man, if, if, we're, if they get that LED wall up here and they played your life up there, what would people really think? If they saw the things you think and the things you do, I would hate to have my life put up there because I know there's still some things in me that don't please God because I have what? A flesh until I step into glory. And the devil will sometimes beat us down and people will tell us, you're not good enough. Man, you call yourself a Christian. And then he's like, when are you gonna really serve God? And hey, yes, what the devil's trying to do? Go to jail in your mind and in your heart. But Jesus says, hey, I've got a card for you. It's called a get out of jail free card. It's called a there's no condemnation. It's called there's freedom in Christ Jesus. But here's the good news. It's not a one-time card. It's an everyday card. You simply say this, God, I thank you. You have my heart. It doesn't matter what people say or people think. Because when you've got my heart, you're going to bless my life. As we close, I'd love to pray for you this morning. In a moment, I'm going to ask for eyes to be closed and heads to be bowed. But two prayers this morning I'd love to pray. Or two groups I'd love to pray for this morning. This morning, you might be a Christian and you love God. You know about God, but the reality, if, if you're honest today, you might say, you know what? God doesn't have my heart. See, the Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart will be. See, there's things of this world that are fighting for our heart all the time. Let me today, you just stop and say, you know what? I need to give God my heart afresh this morning. I'd love to pray for you. You know, I love the story of the prodigal son. He walked away with his blessing and he ended up in a pig pen. And he's down and out. He's blown his blessing. He's messed up. He's sinned. He's done crazy stuff. And he says, you know what? If I go to my dad's house, I'm going to say, he makes this, this excuse in his mind. Dad, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I am not worthy to be your son. Just make me your slave. At least I'll have a roof over my head and food. And he comes to his dad and he says, dad, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned. Against, I've messed up. I've blown it. My heart was in a mess. And that he says, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm not worthy. The dad doesn't even hear him. The dad turns and says, get the robe, get the ring, get the party ready. Cause my son that was lost is found. You don't have to make excuses with God. You don't have to pretend with God. You just say today, Lord, I thank you for a new day. I thank you like David said, creating me a clean heart, Lord, because you got blessing for me. You got a plan and a destiny. I need, to, I need you to heal my heart so I can guard my heart. It's because why? It determines the course of my life. Come on, if you're a Christian and you just, man, you're just down and out today. God, yes, my heart. I'm giving it all to you. The second prayer today is if you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Ecclesiastes chapter three says there's a void in the heart of every human being that only God can fill. See, we can try and fill that emptiness in our life with all kinds of things, money, people, stuff, but the reality is only one thing fits and that's God. Until you find God, you're always gonna be empty, my friend. So why not today invite a God that loves you and says, man, I forgive you of your sins. See, God doesn't send people to hell, it's sin that does. God's plan is that everybody should come to repentance and salvation. So if you're here today, you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I'd love to pray with you. Because the Bible says, if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Not you might be, could be, you will be saved. It's simply saying, God, yes, my heart, and I need you today. I invite you in to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for a new beginning today. And you know what the Bible says? He removes the old. He sets us free and He fills us with His presence. If that's you today, I've been away from God and I need Him today or maybe for the first time, I need Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. I'd love to pray for you. His eyes are closed and heads are bowed really quickly. I don't want to keep you long. Eyes are closed and heads are bowed. If you're watching online, man, if that's you, you just put your hand on your heart and we're going to include you in this prayer as well. But here we go, my friend. I know the Lord's been touching people this morning. 
Let's stop pretending. Let's be real with Him. Eyes are closed, heads are bowed. In a moment, I count to three. On three, if that's you, pastor, pray for me. His eyes are closed and heads are bowed. Shoot that hand up. I'd love to pray for you. I'm gonna pray for you today and I believe, I'm gonna agree with you because I believe the Lord's here and He's gonna do something amazing in your life. It's time to get planted in the house of God. Hands going up already. Beautiful. Here we go. One, two, three. If that's you, shoot your hand up right now. Raise them up high. Eyes closed. No more looking around. Let's be sensitive. See hands going up everywhere. Up in the balcony, all the way along the top, on the bottom floor. Your hands. My goodness, Lord. Hands. Say, Pastor, why raise my hand? Because you're not just raising your hand. You're raising your heart this morning. You're saying, God, here's my heart. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. I'm ready today. I'm just giving it to you. You know me better than I know myself. And I thank you today for freedom. For you are my anchor, my hope. You're going to bring the change. The abundant, blessed life. We're gonna pray right now. Come on, those Christians, they need to hear you. Let's pray loud. Let's declare it together. Let's agree with them. So repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you today for speaking to my heart. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for chasing after me. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus for me. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of my sins to wash my life clean. I thank You for a new beginning. I ask You, Jesus, to be my Lord and Saviour. And I'm choosing this day to follow You. I'm choosing this day to give You my heart. And I thank You, Jesus, for what You're about to do with my life. Thank You that my future is secure Thank You that I have Your peace in Your presence. I'm a child of God. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on church, let's give them the biggest hand that we've ever given them. We're so excited.